Okay, let me open the, the, the next session of, uh, of the second day. So, and the next lecture uh, will be Andrew Forbes, the, the famous, the great, and he will present his, <laughs> his I, I hope, remarkable lecture. Please, Andrew, you have one and a uh, half hour. All right, <clears throat> well, thank you very much for the introduction. I, I don't know if I'm great, but I'm going to do my best to give an entertaining talk that hopefully gives you a bit of an overview of what we do and an introduction to the field. Let me share my screen. And with a little bit of luck, you should see my opening slide. If I don't hear from you, I'll assume that it's all fine and I'm going to continue. It's fine. So the title is Structured Quantum Light. I'm going to introduce what I mean by structured light, bring it into the quantum realm. But before I do that, let me introduce myself. So I am from Wits University. It's in South Africa. I wish I was there in person. I always love in-person events, and I always love going to, to Russia. But, uh, but since I'm not there, let me bring you to where I am. So I'm at the bottom of Africa. So here is South Africa. In fact, I have a, an affiliation in Cape Town. It's where everybody wishes they lived. I grew up in Durban. It's a surfing town. It's on the Indian Ocean. It's very warm and tropical. I actually live just outside Pretoria, which is the capital of the country. And then about a 30-minute train ride to the south, you find the financial capital, which is Johannesburg. Johannesburg at night, not such a great city. Um, like most African cities for that matter. But if you go into the suburbs, then in fact, Johannesburg is the largest man-made forest in the world. So the suburbs are very beautiful, but you have to come back into the city center to find the university. And so here we are. <clears throat> and so even though it has a W in the name, it's pronounced, it's a, a Dutch name. And Witwatersrand, runs the, the literal translation would be a rand of white water because there's a very large aqueduct under the city. It's one of the few major cities in the world without a river running through it. Uh, the university has produced some notable people and next year, in fact, will be celebrating 100 years. And if you come a little bit to the left of this great hall, you find the School of Physics. And in the School of Physics is my lab and we play with structured lights. Traditionally, we, we structure the light with digital holograms, but I'm going to show you more general techniques than just that. So let me begin by explaining what I mean by structured light. And for that, I'm going to give you a very simple cartoon. <clears throat> you see it here. And the, the, co the concept goes like this. Imagine I'm given some blob of light, maybe from a laser pointer, the Gaussian beam. And imagine that I wish to convert it into something else, maybe the smiley face that you see here on the right. And the question we simply ask is, okay, what is the optical transformation needed to convert what I have into what I want? And the answer to that problem often cannot be decoupled from the way you're going to implement the answer. And that's what we mean by structural line. What do we have to do to make this possible? And obviously, you can imagine there would be a very simple solution just by controlling amplitude. So I could take a glass plate and a black pen and simply block out everywhere here that I don't want lights. Well, that would work, and I would get my smiley face. On the other hand, you would say, well, that's very lossy. Why don't we do it by a phase method? So how would that work? But essentially, I would be saying, everywhere I see lights, I want constructive interference. And everywhere I don't have lights, I want destructive interference. So what should the phase map look like that executes this transformation? And if I find that phase map, of course, I could implement it as a metasurface or diffractive optic. But in today's talk, I will speak primarily about digital holograms with uh, digital devices. And so if you take concept of here, uh, to control the amplitude, in fact, you can generalize it to all degrees of freedom of light. I don't have time in, in this talk to go through that because it's not meant to be a classical talk, but uh, take it from me that 
In fact, you can apply this approach to structure the amplitude, the phase, the polarization structure, and many other degrees of freedom as well. And so when we talk about structuring lights, although I'm primarily going to speak about the spatial degrees of freedom of light in today's talk, which is also more or frequency degrees of freedom. And that's what we mean, control over light degrees of freedom to give it structure according to the application that you're trying to target. So in today's talk, we're going to deal mostly with spatial light modulators that come in two forms. The one is a liquid crystal device. So let me take a moment to explain that. And the other is a digital micro mirror device. So in our lab, we usually use devices like this. It's simply a spatial light modulated with a liquid crystal display. It's about 2000 by 1000 pixels. Each pixel has got these little liquid crystals that can be rotated by an applied voltage. And we can calibrate the devices so that for a given refractive index change by this rotation, we get a desired phase change. And so because we have about 2,000 by 1,000 pixels, we have very good spatial resolution. We have very good phase resolution, typically 8-bit encoding. And so we can generate very complex holograms. In fact, it's not so well known that even though this is a phase-only device, it's only changing the phase of the incoming beam, I can use it to implement amplitude and phase control. So in fact, the smiley face I showed you earlier is an experimental image created with this hologram. It also is not so well known that you can do this across a wide range of wavelengths. We often think about phase changes being heavily wavelength dependent, but you can play some Fourier tricks to get around that problem. And so you can work with broadband lights as well. <clears throat> and if you want to know more about this topic, um, you can have a look at the little book that we've written that explains it and gives all the MATLAB code to get started in the lab. So how does it work that you can make a, a phase-only device also control amplitude? Well, I'm going to explain it again with a cartoon equation. So here on the left, you see two phase functions, e to the ix, which in this instance happens to be an orbital angular momentum mode, which I'm going to explain later, and e to the minus ix. And you see that if I add them together, of course, I get something that goes like cosine x. Well, everything on the left-hand side is phase only, and everything on the right-hand side is amplitude only. And of course, they're equal, and so by playing appropriate tricks, I can move from a phase-only device and make it do amplitude, but also an amplitude-only device and make it do phase. And uh, <clears throat> it doesn't matter what the capital X is. It's, in this instance, it's orbital angular momentum, which I'll explain shortly with the little grating. The grating simply tells us where to look. So the message is that I can take these spatial light modulators and arbitrarily control the light. Just for completeness, I want to tell you that these days, we actually tend to move away from liquid crystal spatial light modulators. And the reason is that they're very slow and they're quite expensive. They're typically in the order of 10 to 15,000 euros per device. So that's, that's pretty pricey for everyone, but especially for, for African physicists. And so if you strip out from a, a conventional data projector, probably the same one that you have in your conference room, what you'll find is a device like this. So it's a little digital micro mirror device. And if you zoom into the screen, you find little micro mirrors. These are MEMS devices, but they're very simple. The mirrors can only switch on or off. They have a park state, but in principle it's, it's on or off. And so they're amplitude only devices, but by doing all the tricks I just showed you in that little cartoon equation, you can again on these devices control amplitude and phase. And so here you see very complex forms of structured light. It's a little experimental animation taken by one of my students and shows the versatility even of this very cheap, simple device. This device, by the way, costs in the order of about hundred dollars versus in the order of 10,000 euros. So it's quite significantly different. And so now you can, of course, generate all forms of structured lights. And here are some example beams with the associated holograms that create them. And if you want to know more about how these techniques really work, then have a look at this tutorial and review article that we wrote a few years back. But if you do all these things I've just told you and you go into the lab, 
And here you see one of my former students doing just that. You can then create arbitrary structured beams. And here you see Angela creating a vortex beam uh, that's shown by long exposure by doing these appropriate little tricks on the spatial light modulators. All right, at this point, the, the audience, particularly the students, are probably wondering, you know, where's the quantum? There's no quantum in this. You're absolutely right. It's all been classical and it's to introduce the core G that we're going to use and what we mean by structures. But of course, we need to do this now at the quantum realm. And so let's, from this point onwards, ignore the classical world and move into the quantum. Now, in my lab, when we talk quantum, what we mean is we have a workhorse that's typically a nonlinear crystal-driven process, maybe spontaneous parametric down conversion. And in a cartoon version of this, you see I like cartoons, we would typically excite the crystal with a UV photon or maybe a, a 400 nanometer diode laser. <clears throat> and by SPDC, we would generate entangled photons in the infrared, typically around 700, 800 nanometers. They don't have to be the same wavelength, of course. I could have a, a non-degenerate uh, process. And we routinely do this in our lab where we generate two different frequency photons. But in principle, this is what I'm going to speak about for the rest of the talk. We excite a crystal, we get the phase matching conditions set up correctly, and we have two entangled photons. I'm assuming that you would have seen this already in many of the other talks, and so I'm not going to concentrate on the SBDC process itself, but rather on the title of the talk, which is how do you get structured quantum lights, the structure of the quantum states. All right, so we know that in entanglement, we can choose in which basis to express this entanglement. In the case of the SPDC, it would traditionally be perhaps in polarization, but I can also write it in linear momentum. In fact, the phase matching conditions give us entanglement and linear momentum, but I can change the basis without changing the entanglement. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my basis to be the patterns of light. So how would that work? Well, here's my little cartoon of the, the animation I just showed you. I'm going to excite a nonlinear crystal. It doesn't have to be BBO, but, but could be. And I'm going to generate two entangled photons. I'm going to send them to the devices I just showed you a few slides back, spatial light modulators. And I'm going to detect them with single photon units, avalanche photodiodes, and count in coincidence. But rather than express the state of the entanglement as polarization, I'm going to use the patterns of light. And of course, there are an infinite number of patterns of light. And this is the idea that by going to patterns, we can go to an infinitely large Hilbert space. And so what's required is that I know how to measure these patterns and that I know how to express the entanglement in these patterns. So the experiment doesn't look too different to a typical quantum experiment. I excite my BBO crystal. In fact, we also use KTPs and many other methods. Here would be a vanilla example of an experiment in our lab. We have about three or four experiments running, but of different types. <clears throat> in one of them, we have a, a 355 nanometer mode lock laser excited in crystal. Depending on how we tune it, we can either have collinear or non-collinear uh, production of the, of the photon pairs. Depending on what we choose, we direct them and split them up, either with a little D mirror or with a, a beam splitter. And here's the difference between a polarization experiment and a structured light experiment. We don't send them to wave plates and half wave plates and polarizers, but instead, instead to spatial light modulator. So spatial light modulator A will change the pattern of photon A and spatial light modulator B would do the same thing for photon B. And of course, we then collect the photons and count in coincidences. <clears throat> and so the key technology looks very similar to a standard quantum experiment, except that we add in the spatial light modulator. The laser, the detectors, the coincidence units are all pretty standard. Okay. One of my students pointed out to me that actually, if you, if you take the value of these devices, you could instead have bought a nice Maserati. And I told him one day I will try it in my research grant to ask for the Maserati instead of the equipment. But uh, 
but unfortunately no Maserati, but we have lots of cool equipment on the tables. So we can generate structured light of any type, as I showed you in the, in the nice video animation of the experimental results. And so the question is, what patterns of light should we choose for our experiments? And our favorite pattern, although it's not the only one we use, as I will show you, is the orbital angular momentum of light. So, so let me give you a, a one slide tutorial of how that works. So here's the blob of light I showed you earlier. <clears throat> it's a Gaussian beam. Its wave fronts are planar, at least. And it gets some curvature, but near the waist it's planar. And this beam carries no orbital angular momentum. But if I take the Gaussian beam and I give those wave fronts a twist, and I twist it once per unit wavelength, well, then the planar wave fronts become helical. They become like, like a spiral staircase. And you see that I get an intensity null in the middle of the field with a ring of light around it, so a donut beam. And this beam carries one h bar per photon of orbital angular momentum. And if I twist it not once, but twice per unit wavelength, then I get a more complex helical structure. <clears throat> you see that the ring of light got a bit bigger because the hole is a little bit bigger. And as I twist it more and more, and here you see three times, it's starting to look like a fusilli pasta. You see the ring has got quite a large radius now and quite a large hole. <clears throat> well, you may have noticed that I was twisting only in one direction, but of course I can twist in the opposite direction and not go positive, but go negative. And so here you see that I can go from not from zero to plus infinity, but also to minus infinity by doing the same process in the other way. And so this is the power of orbital angular momentum. So let's bring this into our quantum experiments. So here's my nonlinear crystal again, but this time I'm being a bit more specific and I'm telling you that I'm going to excite it with a UV beam that doesn't have any orbital angular momentum. So the initial OEM is zero but orbital angular momentum is conserved in the SVDC process. That means if I add the OAM of photon A to that of photon B, and I've dropped the H bars here, it must add up to the pump, but the pump is zero, so it has to add to zero. So how many ways can you add two numbers to zero? Well, there are an infinite number of ways, right? I could, could be that photon A is plus one, in which case photon B would be minus one, or the other way around. Or it could be that it's two and minus two and so on. And you can see that because every one of these possibilities could uh, be in the system, it means that the state of the, of the, two, pho the two photon states, sorry, must be a superposition of all these possible outcomes. So one and minus one. large Hilbert space describing a biphoton state. And that's the power of orbital angular momentum over spin angular momentum over just the polarization of the light. Just for completeness, I want to mention that you don't have to only pump with L0. In fact, you can pump with any structured beam you want. And of course, as you change the structure of the pump, you likewise change the structure of the entanglement that you're going to get out. And I'm not going to talk about that anymore. And if you'd like to understand it better, you can read a recent article that we've written on this topic. Okay, what is true in both these systems is that what we measure determines the final state. And the measurement is done with these spatial light modulators. So how do we make a detection system that is sensitive to the pattern of the light? Because we want to express our basis in patterns of light. So it's very easy. Remember I told you that I could take my blob of light, the Gaussian beam, for example, pass it through my digital hologram written to these digital devices and create any pattern of light I want. For example, a Bessel beam. Well, this is the creation step. 
by the reciprocity of light, the detection step would just be the reverse. So if I take this Bessel beam and pass it backwards through the hologram from the reciprocity of light, it must return back to the Gaussian mode. And in fact, the Gaussian mode is the only pattern that will couple into a single mode fiber. And so you see the combination of this hologram plus a single mode fiber gives you a detector that is sensitive only to this pattern. Any other pattern would not produce a Gaussian and would not couple into the fiber. And so this is a pattern sensitive detector is what we need to, to put at the back end of our quantum experiments. And in fact, the first time this was done was about 20 in his group. He didn't have spatial light modulators at the time. He made diffractive optical elements and he encoded the orbital angular momentum, the complex conjugate of it that he was looking for. And he coupled into these, these what he called the monomode optical fibers, but we would today call them single mode fibers. And this combination is the detector. And with this, he could confirm orbital angular momentum conservation in the SVDC process. So for example, look at the middle panel. If you start with zero on the pump, as I showed you, indeed, if photon A is two, then photon B is minus two. If photon A is one, then photon B is minus one, and so on. And if you shift the pumps per AM from plus one to minus one, then of course the diagonal just shifts so that the sum of A and B adds up to whatever the initial pump was. So that was a pretty cool experiment. It was a groundbreaking experiment because it really set the scene for everybody else to move forward with uh, structured light as a basis for expressing entanglement. Today, if we were to do his experiment in my lab, we wouldn't use uh, diffractive optical elements that are hard coded. We would use our digital holograms for photon A and B, and we would encode the spirals as phase masks written to these devices. So here you see I'm changing the OEM that I'm looking for on photon A, and at the same time trying to measure an OEM of photon B, and in coincidence, I look to see what I get. So here would be a typical experimental result from my lab. This would be typical for actually many labs around the world. And you see that as I change the OEM of photon A, Let's say I measured it to be 10, then when it's 10, you get minus 10 on photon B. <clears throat> so this confirms the conservation of OEM down to a single photon level. It doesn't actually confirm entanglement, but at least you gives you an idea of how many modes are involved in your down-converted process. So if you didn't know it before, I can confirm for you now that infinity is 20. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, 20 is a hell of a far from infinity. And I agree that's true. But it's also an order of magnitude bigger than 2, which is what you get with polarization. So for practical experimental reasons, for example, the size of apertures in the system and the finite clear aperture of optics, we can't really get to an infinitely large Hilbert spaces, but we can get much, much bigger than you could with other degrees of freedom. To confirm the entanglement, we can reproduce all the prior entanglement witnesses and tests. For example, we can reproduce LN aspects experiments by trying to violate a Bell inequality, but this time, instead of turning polarizers, we turn digital holograms. And you see here's a result actually for Bessel beams showing that we can violate this inequality and, and establish entanglement in the Bessel basis. Of course, a, a more rigorous way to do things would be to do a quantum state tomography. So how would a quantum state tomography look like for structured light rather than polarization? So for the students in the audience who perhaps haven't done a quantum state tomography, let me just give you, a, again, a cartoon explanation about what it really is about. So the idea is that you have some very complicated object, but you're not able to measure it directly. And instead, you're only allowed to use a torch and look at the shadow of the object on a wall. So you can shine a torch, let's say, in this direction, and you see the shadow here or you can shine it in this direction and see the shadow there and so on. 
And now I ask you by just looking at the projections, the shadows, can you reconstruct what this object looks like? Well, that's what we do in the quantum world. We can't measure the entire states at once, but we can measure the outcome of different projections. We can ask the state questions. Are you this or are you that? And by looking at all the projections, we try to rebuild the states. And that is the process of a quantum state tomography. And to get an idea of how you might do it with patterns, it's very instructive to go back to polarization. So imagine this represents photon A and it's in the polarization basis. And here's photon B along the, the going across the row here. And it's also in the polarization basis. Well, by looking at the grids, I can work out what types of measurements I would do to, for example, get a quantum state tomography. And that would be all the stuff in yellow. So I would measure the right and the right states, the left and the left states, and so on. And I would, I would do all the mutually unbiased bases of the linear states, and I would compare all these outcomes. And to work out what to do with the patterns of lights, we just have to draw a correspondence from the one to the other. So for example, what is the equivalent of say right and left circularly polarized light in the orbital angular momentum basis? Well, it would be the OAM of one and minus one, a helical twist to, that's clockwise and a helical twist that's anti-clockwise. Okay, cool. How do you get the linear states? How did you get all these states? Well, you took superpositions of these two, the left and the right, with relative phase differences, and that gives you the linear states. So therefore, the equivalent state to measure in the pattern of light would be the same, a linear combination of these two OEM states, but with relative phases. And in fact, for the plus minus one case, that just gives you the Hermite Gaussian beams. But you see that they've been rotated. So the pattern of light gets rotated just like the polarization state gets rotated. And so from this simple correspondence, you can get a feel for, well, what would it look like at least in two dimensions? And the first people to do this was actually from Miles Paget's group uh, about a decade ago, a little bit over a decade now. And what they realized is this correspondence, so you know, equate the spin states to the OEM states, and then superpositions will give you these superpositions of holograms. And so instead of rotating a, a, the polarization state, I just rotate the hologram. And that's what I measure for, for my tomography. And they measured the first density matrix in this way. <clears throat> and so to unpack it a little bit, imagine I took L3 and L minus three, then these would be the two orthogonal states and the superpositions of them with a relative phase will give you the rotated mutually unbiased states. And from this, I can get all the coincidences for every possible combination of these. And from that, I can reconstruct the density matrix. But I told you that we have high dimensions in our system, not just two. So how do we extend this two-dimensional case to high dimensions? And I'm not going to go into all the details, except to say that if you replace the Pauli matrices with the Gelman matrices, you can extend tomographies from two dimensions to high dimensions. And here you see a two-dimensional density matrix experimental and a high-dimensional density matrix also experimental from our lab. And that is simply by taking this idea of projections in any dimension with holograms, just changing the projections on the two spatial light modulators. Now, there's a problem with this process. In two dimensions, quantum state tomography is fine. It's pretty fast, there's no problem. But it scales very unfavorably with dimension. It goes approximately like D to the power of four. And so that means that the more dimensions you add, it quickly blows up. So for example, a 10 dimensional state doing a tomography uh, could in fact take, uh, take weeks and weeks and weeks, a very, very, very long time. And so that's really not, uh, not feasible. 100 dimension would take many, many years. 
So even though we have access to high dimensions, the toolkits to really probe those dimensions is really still quite empty. And that's where a lot of effort has been put into how to witness high dimensional entanglement, how to quantify high dimensional entanglement. So quite recently, we tried to dream up another approach to bring in the time down to get an idea of how many dimensions are involved in the entanglement without having to spend many, many weeks doing tomographies. And the idea goes like this. You take the best of the Bell parameter test and the best of a tomography and you bring them together. So by loading superpositions of holograms on the spatial light modulators, I can test in large superposition spaces. And if I rotate the one relative to the other, I will get a curve that has some visibility. It's kind of given me an indication of, is there any entanglement at all in these combinations of spaces? And the visibility that you see as you rotate the holograms, it, it tells you something about what's going on. In fact, if you do the theory, what you find is that if you look at the dimensions involved and the purity of the state, so a purity of one means no noise, and a purity of zero means you just have noise, okay? Well, you find that it's a monotonically increasing function, or the visibility is a monotonically increasing function with dimension and purity. So what does this mean? So it goes like this. You do one measurement with one superposition. So you measure a visibility. But, you know, if you imagine the visibility is a plane going through this, this surface, it means that you don't know the dimensions or the purity, but you know the line, the intersection, this red bar here, everything on that curve is a possible solution. Then you change the superposition, so you have a different combination, and you repeat the measurement. Well, you get a different visibility, and you also have a different curve. And so you have a different cross-section. It must also satisfy this curve. If you plot all these different curves of solution spaces in a plot that goes like K and P, dimension and purity, then you see that they must intersect somewhere, which is the true dimensionality and the true purity. And so this tells you that with very high confidence, this must be what your system has got. And in this particular instance, it's about 22 dimensions and a purity of about 45%. So this is a very fast approach because it's kind of like a bell measurement, but many of them with complex superpositions, but quickly tells you how many entangled dimensions are you working with. So we have got a tool now. It works even for mixed states, but I still believe that the toolkit is pretty empty. And if I was a student in the audience, it's a topic that I think needs a lot of attention. All right, so imagine now that I have my experiment working. I've got some tools to see what's going on. What should I do with this quantum structured light? Well, the first thing you can do is you can use it to tailor what the entanglement looks like. So for example, here is a case with Bessel beams. Now, Bessel beams have got a particular cone angle. That means it's got like a radial turn to it. And I can use, and here's the radial turn plotted here, as I tune the radial degree of freedom, I can tune what the OEM spectrum looks like. So if I, if I have no cone angle, I basically just have normal OEM beams and I get a spectrum like this pinkish one with lots of counts on L0 and decreasing as I go to higher dimensions. But as I increase the radial degree of freedom, so I, I use the other degree of freedom of structured light to control what's going on, you can see that what happens is I start to flatten the spectrum. And the larger the cone angle, the flatter the spectrum becomes. And that's very useful because in this case here, only the opposite L values would be maximally entangled because they have relatively the same amplitudes. But if I took the L naught and the L10, well, they have vastly different amplitudes, so they cannot be maximally entangled. But here, by flattening the spectrum, I can get very different L's still to be maximally entangled, even maximally entangled in a higher dimensional space. 
And so I can use this to tune things like the fidelity with dimension or the linear entropy with dimension. And I can use it to tune how many modes are involved in the entanglement. I can tune the spectrum from being very narrow to very wide by just playing with what types of structured light do I use. This was using Laguerre Gaussian beams, tuning the radial degree of freedom of that. And this exotic spectrum is with Hermite Gaussian beams, projecting into Hermite modes, but then expressing it in terms of the orbital angular momentum. So here you see many diagonals and not just one. So one can tailor with the different indices and the different patterns of light. There's something else you can do that's not possible with polarization. Patterns of light have a size. They also have a radius of curvature. So I can use the size of the pattern. In other words, the embedded Gaussian beam width or the radius of curvature of the lights as extra degrees of freedom to change and tailor the entanglement. So here again, I show, uh, look at the bottom one, the orbital angular momentum spectrum, but this time plotted as a function of what is the Gaussian size that you're coupling into these single mode fibers. That changes the overlap, the photons. And so So, and in fact, this plot here is theoretical and the plot above it is experimental. And you can see that with no tuning, just choosing a bog standard size, you get a very narrow spectrum, but choosing the size appropriately, you can widen that spectrum considerably. And so you have a lot of degree knobs, I like to call them knobs. You have knobs that you can tune and dial in order to tune the entanglement that you get. Well, that's all well and good, but do you get any other benefits by using the patterns? For example, do any of the classical properties of structured lights translate into properties of the quantum states? Well, I've been talking about Bessel beams and if you have not encountered them before, then one of the, the much celebrated properties of a Bessel beam is that they are supposedly self-healing. So how that works is that imagine in the classical world, you illuminate an axicon, just a conical lens. Then in this diamond region, the shaded region, you form a Bessel beam. And now you place an obstacle, like a, a block in front of the beam. And so part of the beam is destroyed. But the theory is that, look, there is a shadow region, but beyond that shadow region where these dotted lines intercept, the Bessel beam should reform because here it is unperturbed. And so beyond the Z minimum, I should again see a Bessel beam in this blue region. And if you do that classically, it works very well. So here's the initial Bessel beam. You can block it, and as you propagate away from this region, you see that you start to reform the central peak and its rings. So the question is, does the self-healing translate into the quantum realm? So we can go back to our quantum experiment, our cartoon of it, and we can place an obstacle in the path of the beam. The interesting thing is, before the light hits the spatial light modulators, we haven't decided in what basis to express the entanglement. So when it sees the obstacle, it's not actually a Bessel photon yet. It's only a Bessel photon after the obstacle when we have made the choice of projection. And if we look at the coincidences, then this is what we see. If we project on the spatial light modulators into the Laguerre Gaussian function, the coincidences stay very, very low and the yellow region corresponds to the sedmin. In other words, this is like the self-healing distance. But if we project into the Bessel modes, you see that indeed inside the shadow region, the counts are very, very low, but then immediately afterwards, they increase very rapidly. And so this is evidence of the self-healing of these 
tangled best quantum states. And you can quantify that by looking at the density matrices. I won't bore you with the details, but here you can see a pristine density matrix in four dimensions to begin with. After the obstacle, when you're inside this uh, shadow region, it's highly distorted because you're just in the noise, essentially. And then as you go out of that region and the signal recovers, you can recover the density matrix from the noise and you see, well, it's very similar, not maybe not identical to what it began with, but the, the unobstructed reconstruction is very, very high. So that uh, gives you an indication that in fact, indeed some classical properties are conveyed across to quantum states. And this can be very useful for a whole range of points. For example, you could do QKD through obstacles. And that's what we show here. So we have encoded and decoded an image by quantum key distribution. But this time we did the QKD with Bessel beams through obstacles. And so you can understand that the robustness of these states through noisy systems could be something as advantageous. All right, at this point, I'm 40 minutes into the talk. I'm going to change gear a little bit. So I, I wonder, shall we keep all the questions for the end? Or are you not too tired? I just continue. Yeah, let's just continue yeah. and keep the questions at the end. All right, brilliant. So let's continue. Questions at the very end. So up to now, what I've shown you, I would not really call it quantitative engineering because all the structured light modes that we're using have been post-selected on these spatial light modulators. And so now we want to know, well, could we engineer the states at the SPDC system, or at least in, in have something in between where we can tune what we want? And a very famous way to engineer states is to use, of course, the Hongo-Mandel effect. And here's a little experiment of the hongo uh, sorry, a little diagram of the hongo mandel experiment, but this time with structured photons. So let me talk you through what this thing is doing and how we're going to use it to engineer high dimensional states. So we have our usual laser, it excites a crystal, and we're going to send the two photons to a beam splitter. And here we're going to let them interfere. And of course, we know that if the photons were distinguishable, we'd get two photons in uh, for the ports. If they're indistinguishable, we would expect to get, you know, <clears throat> sorry, if they're indistinguishable, we get a dip. So we get two photons from each port. If they're distinguishable, we get one from each port. What we want to ask is a slightly different question. What happens if the two photons arriving at the beam splitter are entangled? Well, now it's not the distinguishability of the photon that matters. It turns out it's the symmetry of the state. And so if the state that arrives at this beam splitter is anti-symmetric, then one photon goes through each of the two ports and we can measure coincidences at the back. But if the incoming state to this beam splitter here is any of the symmetric states, then in fact you don't need coincidences because both photons either go in this port or both photons go in that port. It's like they're not distinguishable. So how do we engineer whether the incoming state here is symmetric or anti-symmetric? Well, the SPDC process for orbital angular momentum is always symmetric. It always gives you a symmetric state. But Orbital angular is just an azimuthal phase. And so we can change the relative phase of the photons by just introducing a rotation onto the beam. And the way you introduce a rotation is just with two dove prisms. That's what dove prisms do. If you put a picture of somebody through dove prisms and you turn these dove prisms, the picture rotates. So by rotating these two dove prisms, I can introduce a relative phase between the two photons. And if you work through the math, you can show that at very particular angles, you can convert the even or the odd OEM terms into the symmetric or anti-symmetric states. The delay line is, of course, just to tune the dip. 
And now there's another difference. The two photons that are going to come out, we're going to send them to spatial light modulators. And here again, we're going to project into particular patterns. So if we can tune these prisms to be to have an anti-symmetric state arriving here, then we'll have one photon in each arm, and we can make projections on our spatial light modulators to determine what's going on with the state that we have at the back end of this filter. So just to verify that it works, here is the Hong Mandel dip for orbital angular momentum. And it's because we came in with the symmetric states. But if I tune my two dot prisms to make that state anti then you see that the dip gets converted into a peak. And so now we have coincidences at the back end on our spatial light modulators. And as I rotate these two dove prisms, I can make either the odd or the even states symmetric or anti-symmetric. And that's what you see here. You know, I can, I can for example, maximize at a particular angle that the, the plus minus one states are anti-symmetric, or I could make the plus minus two states anti-symmetric by tuning to different angles. And so I have some degree of control and it's not just a post-selected process. The state arriving has been engineered, at least at the back end of the filter. And to show you that this works in even high dimensions, I can take an initial six dimensional state. I part without going through the Hong Mandel filter. I have a superposition of plus one, two, and three. So plus minus one, plus minus two, plus minus three in OEM, shown by these bars. And now I can tune my prisms to cut out all the even states. And you see that when the filter is set to this angle, so that's with the dove prisms, the even states are symmetric, they get cut out of the process, and I'm left with the state that's only all the odd terms. So I have some degree of control over the states. But most importantly, I can tune it to be symmetric or anti-symmetric. And tuning to be anti-symmetric, of course, is a very useful thing to do. Why? Because then I can do entanglement swapping. So this experiment is the first entanglement swapping experiment with the orbital angular momentum of light. And before you look at the big experiment, just look at the little inset here at the bottom. Let me give you a little story about how entanglement swapping works. So now instead of one crystal generating two photons, A and B, I have two crystals, another one over here, generating another pair, and I'll call them C and D. And the idea is that I would like to, you know, photon A and photon D initially are completely independent because they come from two different crystals. And what I want to do is I want to establish correlations between A and D. So how do I do that? Well, I take one of the photon pairs from the first crystal, so photon B, and I interact it with photon C, so the photon from the second crystal. And the interaction here is just a beam splitter. And as I just explained to you, if the state coming into this beam splitter is anti-symmetric, then you will get the one and another photon out in the second port. So you will get coincidences, but only if it's antitric on four way here here and here so four way coincidences then i can be sure that this must have been anti-symmetric in which case i would have established between these two photons and this is what the experiment looks like at least as the car crystals one and two you see the four photons being directed, two of them to a beam splitter, the other two to spatial light modulators, and I'm going to make my four-way coincidence counts. And so indeed, you can see the, the Hong Mandel dip again, this time for four photons, and not perfect visibility. It's quite a hard experiment, at least for us to do. So, yeah, but not too bad. And here we can confirm this is a tomography of photons A and D that were initially independent. And so we can confirm that we have got entanglement swapping and in fact teleportation, but in this two-dimensional subspace. So every two-dimensional subspace has got these correlations. 
In high dimensions, you get mixed states, but actually we have just overcome that problem. And in about a week's time, you should find the paper on the archive. All right, let me show you something quite fun that we did with this uh, entanglement swapped experiment. We asked a very simple question. So imagine that everything happening in the middle is doing its thing. We have an anti-symmetric state here. And I'm only interested in what's going on with photon A and what's going on with photon D. So the two photons either side of this big drawing. And what we thought to do is, well, what happens if you try to do ghost imaging? So imagine I imprint an object, say a lambda, on the spatialized modulator of photon A. And I'd like to try to do some imaging to see if I can see the lambda on photon D. Ghost imaging is a very standard technique that's been around for a long time, but it's traditionally done with two photons from the same crystal, or it's done with thermal light that's interacted with the beam filter. But the source of the photons, usually they are already correlated. But here, photon A and D initially have got no correlation at all. In fact, they're completely independent. So could we get ghost imaging between these two arms? And the theory predicts something very strange. The theory says, if your object was a lambda, let's say the lambda was white and the background was black, the theory says that for the anti-symmetric states that you're projecting on, the outcome will be a contrast inverted image. So instead of a white lambda, a bright, let's call it a bright lambda on a dark background, we'll get a dark lambda on a bright background. But only if you project into the anti-symmetric state. If you pro project into a symmetric state, then you see the same image of the object. And in fact, it's not really the symmetry. It's the idea that two indices are not the same. Now, you might be wondering, OK, could it really, why would a projection on an anti-symmetric state give you a contrast inverted image? And I can explain it very easily by going back to orbital angular momentum. So here's our cartoon again. We have got no OEM coming into the two crystals. This is crystal one and two. We have four photons. Let's say that I measure this photon here, photon D, to be L minus two. Well, then we know that this photon must be plus two. Okay, let's say that I try to measure photon A to be one. That means that its counterpart must be minus one. So can you form an anti-symmetric state with a minus one and a two OEM? Yes, because they're not the same. So if I go back here, the indices here are not the same, so it is possible to do it. You notice in the symmetric states above, they are the same. So we need two things to be different for the anti-symmetric states. Okay, let's try a different combination. Let's say I, I try to, I measure minus two here, and I'm going to try to also measure minus two in photon A. Well, if this is going to be minus two, then its counterpart must be plus two. But then the two photons arriving at the beam splitter will be the same. And if they're the same, you cannot generate anti-symmetric states. In fact, if they're the same, you'll get two photons going through one port. And so we call this the anything but argument. Whatever you did here, you can find anything except that on this port. And so in the case of the image, it means that if you send a bright lambda, then the theory says you should be able to measure everything except what you're trying to send. So if what you sent was bright, what you measure must be dark. And if what you sent was dark, what you measure must be bright. And the experiment confirms that. So here's a very simple object. Lambdas were a little bit too complicated for that experiment. It's, a, it's just a two-dimensional object. We switched on the left photon. Uh, sorry, we switched on the left pixel, and the right pixel is switched off in the object. The theory says that the image should be contrast inverted. The bright pixel becomes dark, and the dark pixel becomes bright. And that's what the experiment also shows. And the same for a four-dimensional case, the bright pixel becomes dark, 
and the dark pixels become relatively brighter. But of course, the light is distributed across many pixels, so <clears throat> the amplitude is not quite as high. And so, indeed, if you try to do imaging in an entanglement swapped experiments, and you project onto the anti-symmetric states as we were doing, you will get contrast inverted imaging. Well, at this point, I've spoken quite a lot about the orbital angular momentum of the light. And you would have noticed that the OEM really only uses the phase of the light. So it's this helical phase structure. But at the very beginning of the talk, I told you that light's got many degrees of freedom. And up to now, I've only really been using the phase. It's almost as a replacement for polarization. I keep telling you that it gives access to my emissions. sphere for orbital angular momentum, but of course there would be lots of different spheres, each one for a different L. So this example here is plus one and minus one, but it could be plus two and minus two and so on. And so the tensor product of these two spaces gives me a higher dimensional space. And the state that I'm describing is now a hybrid entangled state. So it's not just an entanglement in one degree of freedom, it's entanglement in two degrees of freedom. Spatial mode, which I'll use orbital angular momentum still, and polarization. And it's very nicely described on this hybrid higher order point rest here. The poles of the sphere would be the scalar orbital angular momentum. It's a linear combination of this state and the opposite state. So like the minus L and left and the L and right. And if you take two scalar OEM beams of opposite helicity and opposite handedness, and you take the sum of the two, the superposition, what you get are the cylindrical vector vortex beams. Things like radially polarized light or azimuthally polarized light. So now the polarization state is inhomogeneous across the beam in the classical world. What's the benefit in the quantum world? Well, the benefit is that you can easily get to a four dimensional space that you can control without any issues. So for example, and these are of course just a classical cartoon, here would be four modes on the equator radially polarized, as a smoothly polarized, and two hybrid states. The only difference between them is flipping the signs and the relative phase. If these are the orthogonal states, what would be the mutually unbiased states? Well, the mutually unbiased state is actually just choosing one of these, but so it's shown at the bottom here, sorry. So a linear combination of the polarizations with one OEM. In simple English, what that means is it's the different OEM beams, the plus and the minus, the plus and the minus, but with a linear polarization, for example, diagonal or anti-diagonal. So you see that it's very easy to form the mutual unbiased states relative to these orthogonal states. And so this gives me a four-dimensional alphabet that is a hybrid state to play with. Why would I choose a vectorial four-dimensional state and not just a scalar four-dimensional state? And the reason is that we don't have a deterministic detector for high dimensions uh, unless you have lots and lots of detectors. But for the vectorial lights, we can make a simple deterministic detector. And I'm not going to bore you with the details, but basically, in this detector, it doesn't matter if I come in with the, with the mutually unbiased states or the orthogonal states. They all appear as blobs of lights. So you see this band of light here and one over there. If you look at the bottom, they're at different positions. 
here and here, depending on where the photon arrives, I know what state it was. And I can confirm this with crosstalk matrices, both for the, this is a one dimension, this is the plus one dimension and plus 10. I can check that everything works and it's all fine. So that gives me a four dimensional space to do, for example, quantum key distribution. And so here I have my orthogonal states and my mutually unbiased states. This is what I would expect. This is the measurement of, the, of this whole tomography of the states. I can use this to generate a sifted key. So I can take an image, use that key to encrypt it and then decrypt it. But most importantly, I can overcome a major hurdle, which is that when we usually use the patterns of laws, we don't have deterministic detectors. We filter the states. That means we keep looking at plus minus one state in a sea of other states. And if you use a filter rather than a deterministic detector, you actually never increase the key rate, even though you go up in dimension. But by using this detector, well, the data points are a little bit off the theory, but we can, we can increase the effective key rate tremendously with dimension. So that's the one benefit of these vectorial states. There's another benefit. They look very similar to vectorial classical light. And now I can treat the two photons that I have in the states as two different degrees of freedom in the classical beam. And if I let one degree of freedom get affected, well, then I can use that as a probe for what's going on in my quantum state. And the argument is that the classical light, the vectorial classical light put at the bottom here, if I write it in a quantum language, looks identical to a quantum state. And so nature can't actually tell the difference between vectorial lights and the way it behaves in a noisy channel to quantum light. And here is experimental confirmation of that. In this case, the noisy channel was turbulence. So on the horizontal axis, I'm just changing how strong or how much noise there is in the medium. One means that there's no noise, and zero means that there's a lot of noise. And on the vertical axis, I'm plotting the concurrence, the degree of entanglement in the two-dimensional subspace. And you see that the classical and the quantum data sit on top of one another. So what I'm doing is I'm putting a quantum state through this noisy channel, and I'm putting a bright vectorial classical beam also through the quantum channel. And they behave the same. The way the vectorial beam decays is identical to the way the quantum state will decay. And so what this means is that I can use my bright classical beam as a probe of the channel. And knowing what the channel is doing, I can correct the quantum state in real time without having to measure it. And that's what we showed. We showed that ordinarily the fidelity of the quantum states would steadily decrease, as you see in these, these yellow or orange dots, as you increase the noise towards zero. But if you use your classical beam to probe the channel and correct the state with the unitary, then you can maintain the fidelity of the state even in a noisy system. You could also do something else. <clears throat> so if you have a look at the state, the hybrid quantum state. So one and two represent the two photons, photon one and photon two. You see that photon one is only entangled in the spatial degree of freedom, the orbital angular momentum of the beam. And photon two is only entangled in the polarization. So here I have this hybrid case where one photon only sees polarization and the other one only sees the pattern. If I ask, okay, but if this is pattern entangled, what is its polarization? Well, it turns out just to be linearly polarized, in, case, in this case, horizontal. What about the polarization entangled photon, photon number two? What is its pattern? Its pattern turns out just to be one pattern. It's a Gaussian. So why is it interesting? Well, 
A Gaussian beam, as I told you earlier, is the only mode that goes through a single mode fiber. This photon number one, that's got many patterns in it, would not go through the single mode fiber. So look at the situation. I have two photons, in, they are in a hybrid entangled state, but one of them appears just to be Gaussian because of this entanglement is expressed in polarization. And the other one appears just to be uh, linearly polarized because its entanglement is expressed in two different patterns. So what I can do is I can take the polarization entangled photon and pass it down a single mode fiber. And that's what I'm going to do here. So I generate, I generate my entangled photons and I send one of them, the Gaussian photon, down some single mode fiber. And the other one, which is entangled in the spatial patterns, I send to my spatial light modulator. And then I recombine and do my detections. So what is the outcome of this? The outcome is that I can send multi-dimensional patterns of lights down a channel that appears to be only a single mode fiber. So it's kind of a balance between you can't send high dimensional states down because there you really do have all the patterns, but I can send multiple two dimensional states down. And this could be very useful for distributing the information to different parties. For example, all the L plus minus one states go in one direction and plus minus two in another direction and so on. In the first experiment, we did this over 250 meters to just verify the principle, but recently we've just shown 25 kilometers in a hybrid entangled states doing QKD. So I'm coming towards the end of the talk and I have one last example to show you and then probably you guys must be exhausted and I'm definitely, my voice is also getting a bit tired here. And that is that, you know, the QKD as wonderful as it is, is really just a peer-to-peer -peer system. You, you know, they, you exchange some information and you work out your key. But in a normal network, we don't want to talk one-on-one -on -one you know, we'd like to distribute information. For example, if I have a key that I would like to share, I would like to share it amongst many people. In this cartoon, I'm just showing two people where I give a person some of the information and this person some of the information is like here in a cartoon shown as half the key. So they each have half the key and if they trust one another, then they can decrypt the message because then they get the whole key. So individually, they can't do anything, but together, if there's trust in the network, then they can decrypt the message with the key. So how does it work? This idea is called quantum secret sharing. So we all know how Q quantum key distribution works. I'm, I don't think I need to explain it to this audience. Alice chooses a, a state, Bob chooses a basis, they do some measurements, they compare the outcomes, they get their key, cool. How does quantum secret sharing work? How do you distribute the key? So let me give you a very simple example. Imagine that I wanted to send, my secret was the intercept of a straight line. So where does my straight line intercept the y-axis? That's my secret. So what I do is I send information to Bob and Charlie and they make some measurements. And actually I discard all their measurements unless their measurements happen to fall on the straight line that I'm working with. And then I tell them, yeah, your measurement was fine, you can use it. So you see that if somebody has one point on the straight line, of course they cannot work out anything about the straight line. They can't work out the slope and they can't work out the intercepts. So Bob doesn't have any information. Charlie also doesn't have any information. But if I give you two points on the straight line, then of course you can very easily work out the slope and you can very easily work out the intercept. So if they trust one another, they can work out the secret. And that's the idea behind quantum secret sharing. So in practice, let me show you how it works and I'll explain a little bit more about it as we go through the setup. So first, we prepare a state and we send it to the parties. So here is a three-dimensional state. 
that combines polarization and spatial mode, Gaussian orbital angular momentum plus one and minus one. The trick, of course, in all quantum labs is how to convert the protocol into an experiment. So each participant has to change the relative phases. But it's essentially they have to perform a unitary on the state. They get the state, they make a change, they pass it on. The next person makes a change, they pass it on. In the lab, those unitaries are just dove prisms and half wave plates, a pattern changer and a polarization changer. And then it goes to all the different parties and then finally goes back to the detection. Depending on whether these unitaries are on the line, so they, they meet some criteria, then we say the measurement is valid. And if not, it's not. And we accumulate all the valid ones. You see that the measurement involves polarization, many wave plates, and again, the spatial light modulator for the pattern detection. And here you see a measured outcome for a three-dimensional case. The fidelity is about 95%, which means the error rate is very low. We can compare the distributor's key and the participant's key. You see the agreement is very, very good. And so we can exceed the Shannon limit by exceeding the dimensions possible just with polarization. And you can extend this to 11 dimensions and 10 parties, which is what we also did. You see my students drew a very nice artistic picture. And so quantum secret sharing really can go very widely with high information capacity per photon. All right, I'm going to conclude now. And I want to conclude with just two slides to show you where I think things are lacking. Because on in these talks, we give the impression that everything is perfect and all the research has been done. So my message to the students in the audience is that we are very, very far from being done with high dimensional structured quantum light. For example, we can create high dimensions with no problem, but we can't detect deterministically beyond four dimensions. We've only ever teleported three dimensions at bit rates of, that are as close to zero as you could care to have them and over very, very short distances. And we have cool protocols that have been demonstrated up to D8 and 11, but we only have quantum random number generators up to D3. So you see, if I look at a little plot of what control do we have on dimensions and what control do we have on number of photons, the picture looks like this. We know how to get to high dimensions, but mostly with just two photons. And we know how to control things in two dimensions with many photons, but not in high dimensions. And if we combine moving with photon number and dimensions, then there've only been about three studies that move in the diagonal, controlling both. And what I want to show you is there's nothing here at all. There's a huge void that has to be filled. And that void is where we need to work. So my final point is that I hope I've convinced you that quantum structured light is a cool area to work and with many exciting possibilities. I want to end with a comment from Robert Boyd. He once told me that, you know, what we're really doing is using the patterns of light, spatial information to convey a message. And that's not new. For hundreds of years, people have been using flags to signal events and information. And really what we're doing in the quantum world is just a very sophisticated form of waving flags. Uh, I need to thank all my collaborators because we love to collaborate and we always do this with other groups. All the experimental results you've seen are from my students. We're a very young, vibrant team. If you've never been to South Africa, we love to have visitors. We love to collaborate. So please uh, contact us and, and come and see us. We, we would love to have you. I'd like to, before I thank you for, for having me, I want to say that if you'd like to hear a little bit more about this field in a less cartoony way, I know I kept it at a very tutorial level, then a few months back, we wrote a very nice, well, I think it's a nice review article that summarizes everything I know about structured light, including quantum structured light. And so if you want a more technical treatments about the field and where it could go, 
then I encourage you to go and have a look at that article. And on that note, I think it leaves me just to thank the organizers again for this kind invitation, for you for listening for such a long time, and uh, and I'm open to questions. Okay, yeah. Thank you so much. And do we still have some time for questions? Uh, actually, I have one question. Could you return back to maybe two or three slides? Where did you uh, demonstrate some, some plot uh, dimension uh, versus uh, number of photons? <coughs> Yeah. Okay. Yeah, here. So maybe I missed something. Uh, how did you get uh, 12 photons? We did. No, no, no. Sorry. Let me explain. This is not our work. This is a summary <clears throat> of what has happened in the literature. How much control has the community got over dimensions and photons? The 12 photon cases by the PAN group in China. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Very heroic experiments. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. so, so yeah, if you do crazy things, you can get too many photons, but still only in two dimensions. Yeah, yeah okay. So please, questions. Okay, I guess everything was so clear <laughs> that we don't have any questions. Maybe, yeah, sure. It was too long. No, no, it's, it's okay. What is the time difference, by the way? Only uh, one hour. Only one hour, yeah. Uh, OK, once again, thank you for your report. Uh, as I understand, you can uh, code your photon in, say, two dimensions. So in one photon, you can resent, say, two bits, uh, if I understood it correctly. So um, if I take a look at this at the site of engineers, I would have a question. Why can't I just increase uh, speed of uh, transmittance? from Alice to Bob, uh, say, by uh, multiplying the, the speed of uh, um, light emission. Uh, is there any other advantage uh, by the speed? Or maybe you can um, code it in some more di dimensions, please. Yeah, brilliant, excellent question. You're absolutely right. If, if speed was... Andrew, something is wrong with the, with the, with the sound. Could you repeat? Sure, get a high information capacity. Either. Andrew, we, we, we cannot hear you. The bastions are more robust to noise. Andrew. So the noise threshold that you can tolerate even in a QKD system is higher. Sec and second, they are, can you hear me all right? They are also no, could, robust could you repeat, to could, could you repeat quantum once cloning. Again? Ah, sorry, I think the network went a bit funny there. Yeah, could you the repeat? benefits are that your noise threshold increases. So your robust to noise is better with high dimensions than with two dimensions. Your robust to cloning is better with high dimensions than with two dimensions. And then finally, you get this benefit of the pattern itself. For example, perhaps the Bessel beam and so on. So there are benefits beyond just the information capacity per photon. Okay. Maybe some more questions or comments? No, sorry. So Andrew, thank you very much once again. Uh, there, there is some question from, from the audience. No problem. Well, okay. <coughs> no, no, just, just one question. Uh, thank you a lot for a very interesting lecture. Uh, maybe I missed a thing. Can you please recall uh, the point? Um, do you uh, have you tried to use uh, this high entangled state of light to transmit it for long distances in the in the atmosphere and so on. I heard about such experiments in Singapore, but they were not, to be honest, uh, quite exciting due to uh, bad, not high efficient detectors and your detectors looks very impressive. Yes, no, that's a great question too. 
<clears throat> as I as I tried to show in the one of the final slides, the distances that have been trans and kilometers and fibers. So high dimensional states, it's still very, very short. There's no real convincing demonstration. The best demonstrations over long distance have not, they've used orbital angular momentum, for example, the Vienna group, but only in two dimensions, not in high dimensions. So again, that is an empty research area. I agree with you, nothing very convincing has been produced and it's an open challenge for the community to still address. Okay. Uh, and also we have one question from, from uh some guy, uh, uh, yeah. So uh, we have YouTube translation, and we have some questions from the chat there. So uh, um, just a moment. Uh, uh, could you please inform the noise level, person, subperson, superperson, for generated states, signal either from parametric down conversion process? So noise level and type of this. Oh, okay, that's quite difficult to answer because the noise level depends on many, many things, you know, how hard you pump, what your gating time is, and so on. I can tell you that the efficiency of the process typically in our lab is about 10 to the minus 12, maybe 10 to the minus 10 if we really push things. Uh, noise levels, if you send me an email, I'll send you one of our latest papers where we actually show different, deliberately different high and low noise levels to measure purity. Can be very substantial to very minimal if we have a very, very small gating time. So, so it's not, let me say it's not too different to the polarization world, except that the spatial light modulators introduce a loss of about 60% each. Okay, thanks a lot. So I think we don't have any, any more questions. So uh, Andrew, thank you very much once again and see you somewhere. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very much.